emergency calls from the public. If you give me your address, please. No, 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 no. True? <sighs> On the first day working as 911 customer service, Joe was really tired of receiving the emergency calls that kept ringing every minute. But it wasn't just him. All his colleagues in the room were also overwhelmed by emergency calls, even his own boss never stopped receiving calls. At this moment, Joe finally realized that his job as a 911 operator was very tough. Moreover, the city of Los Angeles is one of the cities with the highest crime rates in United States. Not only that, the situation is now getting worse due to forest fires in most parts of United States. Everyone in the room was too busy to even have time to just brew or buy sugar. While returning to work, Joe gets an emergency call from a woman named Emily. On the phone, Emily can be heard crying while speaking incoherently. Joe, feeling strange, plans to hang up the phone. But suddenly a man's voice was heard. There Joe realized that Emily was currently giving him a code indicating that he was kidnapped. So that the kidnapper does not suspect. Emily pretended to call Joe by her son's name. Quickly Joe told Emily to answer his question slowly. After communicating with each other using a code. Joe managed to find out the characteristics of the kidnapper's car. That is a white minibus. While monitoring Emily's position from her cell phone's GPS signal. Joe immediately called for help. The kidnapper is getting suspicious trying to snatch Emily's cell phone. In the midst of the panic, Joe told Emily to stay calm and call him later when she got the chance. When the call ends. Joe asked the nearest patrol police from Emily's location to close the access road and check every white minibus that passed nearby. But unfortunately, the policeman refused because he was busy dealing with the fire. He and other patrolling police tried to evacuate and it was impossible to close the road just to save one life. He then asked Joe to find out what the license plate number of the kidnapper's car was to make it easier for the police to find her. Hearing that, Joe was annoyed. But no matter how hard Joe pleaded. The police still told him to find out the license plate number of the kidnapper's car first. Joe then found the address information, as well as Emily's home phone number from the police data. When contacted, the phone was picked up by Emily's five-year-old son, Ebby. While frightened, Ebby told Joe that earlier his father, Henry, came to the house carrying a knife and forced his mother into the car, leaving Ebby alone with his younger brother, Oliver. Ebby also said that now Oliver was sleeping in the bathroom. Hearing Ebby's story, Joe immediately found out information about Hendry. In police data. Then came all Hendry's personal information. Starting from the address, car plate number, to Hendry's criminal track record, who has been in and out of prison several times. Seeing these data, Joe is sure that Emily's husband is the abductor and that Emily is experiencing domestic violence. Worried about disturbing the other customer service, Joe decided to move rooms. Then tried to ask his superiors at the police station to help Emily. But his boss got angry and told him to focus more on solving his own case, rather than helping other people's cases. At the trial of Joe's case to be held tomorrow. His superiors have instructed all members of the Los Angeles police force to help give false testimony so that Joe can escape the law and the good name of the police can be maintained. He also ordered Joe to serve his sentence as 911 customer service according to the SOP only. No need to get too deeply involved in other people's problems. When his sentence is over, Joe can more quickly return to being a field police officer again. Hearing his boss's words, Joe was silent. As soon as memories of his case a few months ago began to resurface, Joe then called his wife. On that call, Joe reminded his wife to come on time according to the trial schedule tomorrow, to help give false testimony. Joe's wife didn't really want to be involved in this case. But his wife felt sorry for him because every day Joe kept asking for her help. She also promised to come to court tomorrow. After feeling a little relieved, Joe returned. Waiting for a call from Emily. He doesn't care if his boss forbids him. As a police officer, Joe cannot ignore the people who need his help. He is still determined to find a way to help Emily at any cost. Not long after, Ebby called Joe, Ebby told him that the police had just arrived. Joe then told Ebby to give his phone to the police. The police suddenly sounded panicked when they saw Ebby's hands were covered in blood, even though he was not injured at all. Hearing that, Joe panicked and when he was examined. The police panic sounded louder, the police found Oliver lying stiff in the bathroom. His whole body was covered in blood and his stomach had been split open. In the middle of the chat, suddenly the phone died. Joe was sure this must be Henry's doing. While holding back his anger, Joe dialed Henry's number. On the call, Joe claimed to be a police officer and said that he already knew all what Henry had done to his wife and children. Henry who felt cornered could not say anything. He kept crying in fear. Joe is fed up. With emotion Joe said that prison sentence alone would not be enough for a ruthless killer like Henry. Joe swore that if he caught him later, he would have Henry executed. After saying that sentence, the phone hung up. 
Joe then asked for the help of his colleague at the police station named Rick. There was the sound of several people laughing. Joe realized Rick must be drunk at the bar. Joe reminded Rick not to drink too much and prepared to testify in court tomorrow. Just like Joe's wife earlier, Rick is actually afraid that his lies will be exposed, but if Joe is not his friend, then he doesn't want to make false testimony before the judge. Joe comforted Rick by saying that everything would be fine. Joe promised when the case was over he wouldn't cause any more trouble. When Rick has calmed down, Joe then tells about Emily, then asks Rick to go to Henry's apartment to look for clues to where Emily was kidnapped. As Rick was gone, Emily suddenly called back. On the phone Joe asked how Emily was doing. Emily also replied that she was sitting in the front seat of the car beside Henry. Joe asked again what is the speed of the car. Emily who doesn't know about cars can only answer that the car is going so fast that it scares Emily. In the middle of the conversation, Henry's voice was angry as he tried to snatch the cell phone from Emily's hand. Heard the commotion. Joe again asked if Henry was wearing a seat belt now. Emily answered. No. After getting a picture of the situation in the car, Joe then ordered Emily to immediately put on the seat belt and then pull the car brakes as hard as possible. Phone disconnected. Joe could only hope Emily would give him news soon. While waiting, he called the patrol police to check the location of the last GPS point on Emily's cell phone, the minutes passed, until Emily finally called again. She informs that Joe's plan failed. When she escaped earlier, Henry managed to catch her and now Emily is locked in the back of the car. Joe also calms Emily by saying that he has a second plan. Joe asked what hard thing was in there. After searching, Emily found a brick. Joe then told Emily to be ready when the car stopped later and Henry opened the back door, so Emily had to hit Henry's head with all his might with the bricks and then run as fast as he could from there. Slowly Emily stopped crying, Emily felt talking to Joe made her heart calm, there Emily vented, she didn't know the reason why Henry was angry even though she was just trying to get the snake out of her second child, Oliver's stomach. Joe was getting confused, he asked Emily to tell him everything in as much detail as possible. Emily also explained that Oliver had been crying all day without stopping, like he was holding back a stomach ache. Out of pity to see her son in pain, Emily decided to split Oliver's stomach and immediately Oliver stopped crying, how relieved Emily's heart was now that her son could be free from pain. Hearing all these stories, Joe was silent. It turned out that his suspicions had been wrong. Then suddenly Hendry heard the sound of opening the back door of the car where Emily was locked, and as planned Emily hit Hendry on the head with a brick. The phone was disconnected again. Not long after, Rick called and said that he had found a clue. After searching Henry's house, Rick found a bill from a mental hospital in the name of Henry's wife, Emily. Joe was so shocked. Trembling he tried to call Henry, when the phone was picked up. Henry was heard crying in pain because his head was covered in blood from the brick impact. Henry tells that Emily has run far away. Henry then told Joe the truth, Henry's goal to bring Emily was to take her back to the mental hospital. Even though he knows the mental hospital will refuse because Henry has no money and his previous bills have not been paid, Henry is still determined to go there to protect his children. On the other hand, even though he is divorced, Henry still loves Emily. Henry was worried that if the police found out about Emily's actions, he would be arrested. After the phone hung up, Joe felt that it was all his fault. If only he hadn't helped Emily escape. If he had not interfered in other people's household affairs, then this event would not have happened. Not long after, Emily called again. Emily told him she was on a flyover. While answering question after question from Joe, Emily suddenly panicked when she saw that there was a lot of blood on her hands. Emily suddenly remembered what she had done to her own biological child, she kept crying regretting her actions while repeatedly saying she didn't deserve to live in this world anymore. Even though she was calmed down, Emily was still crying hysterically, Emily then said that she wanted to jump under the flyover to follow Oliver to heaven. Joe's heart broke. He says whatever Emily's past mistakes Emily still deserves to live. If there really is someone who doesn't deserve to live in this world, it's Joe himself. Joe knew exactly how Emily felt, because Joe had also killed people. While crying Joe told all his sins. The sin that caused him to now have to serve his sentence. A few months ago while still serving as a field police officer, Joe misfired and accidentally shot a young man on the street to death. Joe also informed that tomorrow he would attend the first trial of his murder case. Joe explained that he and Emily were the same. Their sins are the same. Their regret is the same. But Emily must remember that Ebby and Henry are always encouraging. All of Joe's words just now made Emily's heart calm. However, when the siren sounded, the police car arrived. Emily panicked again then said she still wanted to go after Oliver to heaven. The phone was cut off. Joe felt very sad and kept trying to call Emily again and again even though the number was no longer active. 
until finally Joe's phone was answered. Unfortunately it wasn't Emily who answered the phone, but the police. The cops informed that they managed to save Emily before jumping in. Hearing the news, Joe burst into tears of joy. A few minutes later, his boss came to tell him that Emily's second child, Oliver, had been saved and is currently being treated at the hospital. Joe could only be silent in relief and then went to the bathroom. From this incident, Joe realized that Emily's case was a reflection of himself. He can easily advise others while he himself tries to bury his sins and run away from responsibility. In his heart, Joe decided to dare to face reality even though he had to be imprisoned, fired, and tarnish the good name of the police. Joe will not run again. Joe then contacted the witnesses one by one in court tomorrow and asked them to testify honestly. <laughs>